Hello. That's your favorite scary movie. Okay, well, I'm not going to wear this throughout the whole video. At least not this part. Okay, that's really warm. Working the mask is kind of... Uh, I haven't really worn this in uh, quite some time. And uh, no doubt, uh, due to the... Uh, here we go. Due to the uh, mask and this costume overall, I'm sure you can... Uh, Guess on what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, that, of course, is uh, the movie. Well, I guess I should uh, say the beginning of a new uh, series of films with the franchise. Um, of course, being Scream. Um, you know, it is December now. And, uh,. This December, it is the 25th anniversary of Scream, the original Scream. Um, so, you know, I've got uh, the movies here. Um, of course, recently, I got the movie on 4K Blu-ray. Um, there. Like that. Got the uh, first three films, the trilogy, as well as two documentaries. Uh, still screaming the ultimate scary movie retrospective. Scream the inside story. And um, yeah, these are all quite good. Um, Scream 4. You know, and all of these, of course, I will talk about, you know, in the coming weeks. DVD of Scream, DVD of Scream 2, DVD of Scream 3, and the DVD of Scream 4. You know, I got this before the Blu-ray, and then got the Blu-ray, and it's like, oh, there's also a DVD with it. Um, Which is uh, okay. But, you know, I'm gonna primarily uh, today discuss the first film. Um, now, I've talked about the franchise as a whole, you know, in general, uh, overall, and, you know, nothing really. Uh, specific with any of the films other than, um, you know, I really, you know, love these films. Um, and again, this is just an, a general discussion of the movies, not really a review of any kind. Um, but I will say I do love Scream. I think it's an incredible movie. One of my favorite horror movies of all time. Um, and, uh, I'll just put this on just for traditional sort of thing now. Um, but yeah, this uh, movie really uh, helped the horror genre um, in the 90s. Um, you know, so of course, you know, you get like spoilers and such will be discussed here and there. Uh, and. Um, you know, with where horror was in the 90s, you know, there wasn't too much happening. Um, you know, there were... A lot of it had to do with, like, franchises, you know. Halloween had a film in the 90s. Actually had a couple movies, but, you know... You know, H2O, which came out in 98, was more uh, successful and enjoyed than Halloween's... Uh, 
sixth. Sixth and Seventh Nightmare on Elm Street films in the uh, later on, you know, like afterwards of the eighties and such, and then there was also uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Nine, and so there's a lot of like horror film franchises that were continuing going. There's also Child's Play and Hellraiser. Though by the fourth film, uh, they began to have that franchise go to direct to DVD or to video, I should say. Um, and with certain exceptions, like you know, Candyman, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of you know excellent and incredible horror films of true note. You know, there was also Leprechaun in the nineties, but you know, still, you know, it's like. None of those stuck a com struck a complete chord chord with people. At least not in the way that Scream did. You know, when Scream came out in '96, it kind of it did revitalize the horror genre, uh, specifically slashers in this case. You know, people uh, went back to the theaters to watch this quite often, over and over. Um, uh, because, you know, it was just an excellent film, you know, from beginning to end. There is actually quite a bit of humor, uh, in it. And so you can, uh, perhaps say this is also like a dark comedy as a result of, you know, the content of the movie, but also, you know, there is quite, quite a bit of humor. Um, and also it's like a mystery. You know, or it is a mystery. You know, like it's a who done it, who who who's the killer, essentially. You know, who's Ghostface? Um, as the killer is known as, essentially, with the mask on. Um, this this first film in particular for me. When I watched it, I watched it on VHS because my mom had all the Scream movies and they're on VHS. And I was about like 13 or so because that was really when I got into horror films, you know. Age 10, of course, you know. Um, saw Jaws, which is really the only film, as I've mentioned before, that truly frightened me. You know, the music and also, no doubt, my love of sharks, you know, got to me when I first tried to watch it when I was six, but finally able to watch it uh, you know year, some years later and enjoyed it um and when i was 11 i saw the sounds of the lambs which was like a psychological horror film and yeah uh, scream uh i watched not too long after i mean it would have been like a year or so but i guess in comparison of to where maybe some people might see their first horror movie that might be years before they watch more depending on their experience, let's say, if it, something really scared them, they don't want to watch a horror film anymore, or again, at least not for some time, you know, this, you know, for me, it was, seemed fairly quick, I don't think I was 12, really, um, that's why I think I was more of like 14, in any case, I saw it during the summer, and since we had all three films, um, I watched them, loved them, thought they're all Really good. Um, this, and then of course, you know, years later, Scream 4 came out. And, you know, I'll talk about that and the other sequels. But, you know, when I first saw this film, you know, um, you know, this franchise was really, the, from beginning to end, the first horror franchise I truly saw in completion. Um, again, yeah, there was a fourth one later on, but when I saw them, it was just three movies. Three movies and, uh, that was really that was really it. That was really cool uh, to see, you know, a beginning, middle, and end uh, franchise. And um, you know, you got Wes Craven, uh, creator of A Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, Freddy Krueger. Um, you know, and, 
and there's so many other uh, uh, notable and very good and effective horror films like uh, Last House on the Left, The Hells Have Eyes, and uh, Serpent of the Rainbow, which I talked about, um, which is a very underrated film, and and many others um, before Scream and you know after Scream. You know this, uh, you know Kevin Williamson wrote the film and he was a big horror fan and Halloween he says is his favorite movie of all time and this movie really does have quite a bit of homages to that as well as other films you know like you know Friday the 13th, Night on Elm Street and so many others you know the this movie is very you know uh, self-aware self uh, you know it's very referential to other horror films you know, and and one character, Randy, you know, Randy Meeks, played by Jamie Kennedy, he explains like the rules of a horror film, like what you can and can't do. Like for what like number one, you can never have sex. Number two you can't um can't do drugs or drink alcohol. And number three you know you can no um you can never ever under any circumstances say I'll be right back because you won't be back um, and you know the uh, how like you know sex equals death and all these other things equal death um, and how things of that nature like having it all laid out was very different and new and many people appreciated that. And then there were, are some people, you know, back then, and I'm sure even now, see Scream explaining the, so overall, these rules that have existed, but, you know, were never verbalized before because you didn't need to. People just knew about it. You do these any of these things, and you're dead. Um, and because Scream explained all that, some people say that, Scream ruined the horror genre. It's thanks to Scream that, you know, many movies copied Scream and that for some time the horror genre became very... went from being revived to then being redundant and uninteresting again. Um, though the whole copying Scream is because Scream was really popular and people enjoyed and loved Scream. So, you know, when something is popular, people often do copy what is popular or take quite a bit of influence of what's popular um, with various, you know, degrees of success. Some are very good at it, some aren't. Um, but again, it always depends on the movie, you know. Uh, you know, uh, you know. these movies you know they do of course you know talk about s certain uh, films like you know at the beginning you know uh, the killer is uh, taunting and uh, uh, toying with uh, Drew Barrymore's character uh, Casey and her boyfriend is there tied to, uh, like, duct taped to a chair and, and I guess some <laughs> gonna get into some spoilers now but you know he's asking her questions like uh like uh, name the killer in halloween and you know she says michael myers and that's correct and that's like a warm-up question because you know uh the fate of her boyfriend depends on her you know either uh you know she plays along and enters correctly her boyfriend and her will know live uh, so the killer says get gets an answer, answer wrong you know they, they they might die so you know she got a warm-up question right and he uh, asks you know which uh, you know name the killer on Friday the 13th and she says Jason but you know that's the wrong answer because as people know while Jason was in the original Friday the 13th and is in all the movies, you know. You know, 
he's not always the killer. And he wasn't the killer until part two. And then the next two sequels after that. And then five, you know, he's been killed off in four. And see him in hallucinations and dreams. But then part six he returns and is, is truly the, you know, mainstay villain of the franchise. But, you know, in the original, it's Mrs. Voorhees, Jason's mother. Because, she, you know, of course, since she, uh, said, uh, uh, got their answer wrong, uh, the, her boyfriend is killed and he's gutted. And, uh, originally, you know, you're supposed to see his insides fall out. Um, but the ratings, uh, board people said that's too much. And, you know, it's a horror movie. You can't show that, even though Something like that is what people would want to see. Um, and of course, you know, stuff like that, you know, people don't like. You know, people aren't too fond of that kind of violence or even horror films. Uh, Wes Craven said that uh, for horror films, um, you know, why people like to go see them, essentially they're already afraid uh, from the moment they buy the ticket and walk into the theater. Even if they don't know they're afraid, they're afraid of something. They're afraid of things in life. They're afraid of maybe certain animals or creatures or whatever. They're, everybody has some sort of fear. So they go into a theater to watch, purposely watch a horror film, like a slasher-like scream, to be scared, to essentially have that exercise, exercise out of it. In a way, you're kind of like having an exorcism of sorts by screaming and jumping and Maybe looking away because, you know, you don't want to, you might not want to watch or see all the kills and maybe how graphic they might be. Um, and, you know, and that was quite graphic, of course, but, you know, there uh, there are cuts, I think, in, like, I think the UK and some other places where, uh, uh, that, like, extended cuts exist. In America, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. You know, in like these documentaries on this uh, set that I've got, there are some, uh, you know, uh, you can see that in like some of the documentaries and stuff like where they show like side by side the original cut of what you people, they wanted people to see and then what people got to see at the end and they kind of had like a black screen for a bit until they show the rest of what it looked, the full scene looked like as it catches up with the extended cut. For instance, you know, for Steve, who interesting people always could say wasn't the first killer, killed, or the person killed on screen in this franchise when he actually was. Um, people say Casey is, and you know, and they have how shocking because, you know, it's Drew Barrymore. You know, at this point in time, uh, Drew Barrymore was the biggest star of the movie. You know, you know, Nev Campbell is the lead, but people, not too many people knew who she was. She was on Party of Five, and she was in, like, uh, The Craft, and some other films, but she wasn't a really complete, well-known, you know, uh, uh, star like she is now, and that's thanks to Scream. Uh, you know, David, David Arquette, there's Courtney Cox, so she was, you know, at the time best known as her friends, so she's sort of the other big star, but, you know, not a movie star like Drew Barrymore. And there's Matthew Lillard, who many people know now, you know, of course, as Shaggy. You know, he was in Scooby-Doo movies. Rose McGowan, you know, this is an early film, and uh, Ski Ulrich, you know, he was doing, you know, getting parts, and this was a real big one for him also. And then uh, there's Jamie Kennedy in the movie, a uh, big part for him. And he was in, had a small part in the Romeo and Juliet film that, start, that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio starred in. But he had pink hair, and his part wasn't overtly huge. You know, it wasn't like uh, something where uh, 
Like he's like a, a, a mainstay character that everybody remembered. You know, uh, I mean, it might be remember the pink hair, but not necessarily his name. But of course, you know, um, all these guys, all these people became really well-known and famous thanks to, you know, Scream. You know, and Drew Barrymore was supposed to be uh, Sidney Prescott, but uh, uh, she decided to be Casey because one of the first big kills of the whole film. And, uh, yeah... Because, you know, she dies, anybody can die. And that's really, that is true. Anyone can die. And as the movie goes on and you see certain things that go on, like certain rules are broken and, you know, like uh, uh, Sydney has sex with Billy, what they skeet over it to. Um, and, uh, you know, she lives, she survives, she, you know, gets to be the final girl despite breaking that rule of what not to do. Um, you know, David Arquette and Courtney Cox, who plays uh, Dewey, Riley, and uh, Gail Weathers, you know, the newspaper reporter, and he's a uh, officer, a deputy. Um, you know, she's a, you know, he, uh, of course, they got married, and it's thanks to Scream that they uh, got together, and uh, by the third film, they got married. Um, that point, and, <clears throat> you know, they have gotten divorced since, but, you know, things seem to be at least pretty good with them, you know, their friends and all, that's always important. They also have a child, so that's good for the child's sake, but, you know, for, for, for those two, like, this film really is important for them because that's where they met. And they may not be together anymore, but, you know... They did. They were a couple for many years, and it's in a lot of a large part thanks to this film. You know, they they got to be become a couple, and um, you know, Dewey was supposed to you know die in the film, but Wes Craven liked him so much that they shot just this one little you know like a little scene of him or a shot or so like of. Him being wheeled into the ambulance alive. And like, and if, like, people saw that or, and liked him, they'd keep it. Or if people didn't like it, they'd just remove it. But it was there just in case they wanted, people wanted him uh, to live. And people didn't, they like him. And he's a very good character. Excellent character. Um. And of course, you know, you know, um, uh, Rose McGowan plays uh, the Dewey sister Tatum, um, Sydney's best friend, and uh, she gives him a hard time. You know, uh, you know, he's a man of authority; he's a police officer, but she doesn't treat him as such, and nor does anybody else. Like his name is Dwight, but everybody calls him Dewey. Um, just shows, like you know. Or sort of like a lack of respect, you know, might accept, you know, people calling him Dewey, like maybe his mom or even his sister, sitting or some people like that. You know, he might accept some people calling that, but the fact that all of his other, you know, uh, uh, co-workers call him that too, just shows like, you know, this town doesn't respect him, you know, Woodsboro. And, uh, I think about Gail Weathers as a reporter. Um, you know, she uh, wrote a book about the murder of Maureen Prescott, Sidney's mother. How a year prior to the events of this film, you know, she was murdered and raped by uh, who has been a man who was convicted of her murder, Cotton Weary, who by the end of the film we find out was innocent and he didn't, you know, uh, do it. He was framed. He was framed by uh, Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, you know, Skeet Ulrich and, Ulrich and uh, Matthew Lillard. Uh, and that's something that this film has really did a very good job of. You know, there's the whole phone thing with the killer on the phone and 
you know, there's a voice changer involved in the Roger uh, McDowell Jackson, you know, doing the voice. It's very great at it too. That voice and how uh, it's very creepy and also sort of soothing all at the same time, which I think is helps with the creepy factor. You know, because it can be very creepy and disturbing. The voice can be when it it needs to, but it also can be very sort of calm and a bit collected of sorts as they talk. Um, and um, and all the people you know, who were on the phone never uh, met him on the set. He was keeping away from her, from all like Drew Barrymore and Nev Campbell, just so the effect of their performance of being creeped out by what the guy's saying would be as genuine as possible because if actually uh, any of them met him they might and they got to know him might possibly their performance could be affected by that they don't want you know of course the performances to be affected in a way where they might not be able to be as genuinely scared or disturbed as they otherwise might be um um, and of course, you know, like, you know, there's, you know, Black Christmas and, um, When a Stranger Calls and other movies where the killer's on the phone. And, um, and the fact also that there's two killers was very, you know, unique, you know, horror films, stuff like that, you know, usually there's one killer, you know, there's Michael Myers, there's Leatherface, Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees. Pamela Voorhees, you know, Mrs. Voorhees, um, Pinhead, um, Chucky, uh, uh, Norman Bates, Hannibal Lecter, uh, Buffalo Bill, um, no, Buffalo Bill was a main antagonist, but, you know, so was Hannibal Lecter, um, and he didn't kill, uh, as many people as we hear, uh, we don't see him kill a whole lot of people in the movie. We only see him kill a couple people, but then uh, it's inferred he killed, of course, more. And uh, during the movie, and also after, or in, or before the film, um, and, and also likely after. Uh, but you know, Buffalo Bill, for the most part of Silence of the Lambs, is really the big, you know, you know killer. Um, but yeah, you know. The fact that, you know, Billy and Stu are both the killers is very interesting in how you find out why Billy uh, killed uh, his girlfriend's mom was because, you know, you know, her mom was having an affair with his dad and she's, and her mom is the reason his mom left his father. And so that, you know, Did not at all uh, sit well with him, and because she was also having an affair with a uh, Cotton Weary, they were able to have, frame him. Also, Cotton Weary and um, Billy had similar hairstyles, so somebody walking out in the place with a, you know, his jacket on uh, from the back looked like. Cotton Weary. Well, in fact, it was actually Billy. And then uh, just the aftermath and also how their plan of framing her dad, like the anniversary of his wife's death, drives him crazy. Goes on a murderous ma uh, killing spree, except for killing everybody except for Stu and Billy. You know, they were left for dead. And then he kills Sydney, his daughter, and then he shoots himself in the head to just end it all. Um, um, and then you see them, of course, stab each other, which is very, you know, shocking. It also just shows how kind of deranged of sorts like they are, you know. You know, Stu's all hamped up and is ready to be stabbed, and then when he is stabbed, it really hurts and then it's you know, of course you know, it's Stu's turn to stab Billy though he has already been sort of cut up a little bit 
we're supposed to believe that and all. But then they're like, oh, there's corn syrup. So like the blood he had when he was stabbed and killed initially until the end when, you know, Sydney goes back into Stu's house. Right? Because there's this party, of course, you know, um, where the rest of the film took place. And, um, you know, Randy's there. He works at the uh, video store. He's a big movie fan. All like horror films, though. Sydney's not much of a horror per fan because she uh, she's puts it earlier in the movie like you know what's the point they're all the same some stupid killers or yeah, some killers stalking some uh, killers bring stalking some big breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the front stairs when they should be running out the front door and uh, it's insulting and uh, you know you see these cliches play out as described at times like that and. You know, and they're stabbing, and of course, you know, back to Stu and Billy, but they're stabbing each other, and Stu gets stabbed more than Billy. And, you know, and he's bleeding a lot, and uh, he had a gun that, you know, Dewey had, you know, because she, uh, Sydney took the gun from Dewey's holster, goes inside, and then Billy takes the gun, he shoots Randy in the Right here, like around the shoulder area, and uh, 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 yeah, and uh, gave the gun to Stu, and uh, he took the knife away from Stu, and then uh, he puts the gun down when he went to get her. Dad, that he kept in like in a, like in a, like a closet, like from like food storage and such, and um, he put the safety on, and Gail, who had been, you know, of course, like uh, been in a car accident with the the news van, and of course her uh, cameraman uh, Kenny was killed. You know, many of these characters are very memorable. You know, even though I'm not mentioning them, but of course so many of them have been talked about. But, you know, like Kenny, the cameraman, you know, and like people like that who, you know, or Tatum. Characters who normally wouldn't be talked about as much, you know, if this was another typical horror film. But, you know, with Stream you're able to care about these characters. Even as the movie goes on, you see the killers, you know, they're they're very interesting, even though they're, of course, terrible and all. With what they're doing and everything, they're just it. They're all it. all these these characters are interesting. Yeah. Um, though Steve seems to be unfortunately forgotten, even though he is the first person killed in the franchise. But I guess because after his death, it's you know, you know, Casey, you know, Drew Barrymore's death, and that was a big shock. Cause it's just like people thought she was the main character. She was like the Janet Lee of the movie. You know. Janet Lee gets killed in Psycho, and everyone thought she was the main character. Well, no, she isn't the main character. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of these some of these things like that also is just... There's a lot of tropes and a lot of honor to horror films of the past. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of uh, tributes to... Uh, just the horror genre in general, um, you know. Uh, oh, so uh, the principal uh, of the school, played by a uh, you know Fonzie himself, uh, Henry Winkler. Uh, you know, there's these characters who are sort of like red herrings, a source like him. He's being very, you know, creepy or. Something's a lot off. There's quite off about them. They could be the killer. You know, Billy. They said it out. He's like the killer. He has to be. But people are always going to dismiss that because they're making it too obvious. So he can't be the killer. But then maybe he is. And then he gets killed. And then, oh, he's alive. But then, oh, he was the killer. What? And then his best friend is the killer. And then they get, of course, dispatched. 
know, Matthew Lillard has some very excellent ad libs. Uh, one of the most memorable and most talked about is when, you know, Sydney calls the phone and using that voice changer uh, with a phone, the father's cell phone that's been cloned by the two of them, so everything links back to, you know, her father, you know, and how uh, you know, she called the police and just hiding, and then how the uh, uh, the two of them are gonna, you know, react to that. Like how, like what are they gonna do? They have to find her, of course. The bad for the plan to, of course, work out. And then she, uh, you know, is talking on the phone. You know, Billy gives Stu the phone to talk to her as he looks for her. And he goes, like, Billy has a motive, you know, but what do you have? Like, uh, he goes, peer pressure, not far too since, and takes, out, takes the phone out of his hand, and he's yelling at her, and he's, then Stu's checking his wounds as he's still bleeding out. And he, in anger, he throws the, uh, phone but the blood was so slippery and wet it just flew out of his hand and so it and it didn't go where he intended it to and he hit Matthew Lillard in the head and he <laughs> it being the phone Nick <laughs> and um uh, stuff like that he was like in character and he just went with it because it wasn't supposed to happen but you know Wes Craven loved it so much they kept it in the movie. You know, no doubt they did other takes where he didn't say that and the film didn't hit him, of course. Uh, but it's things like that, you know. Matthew Lillard, I think, is a really... I mean, everybody in the movie is excellent. Everyone does their part well. But if there's one person, I think, in this film who is really just... is the standout guy, it's Matthew Lillard. You know, um... And with... I've mentioned before, like with horror and like and awards, you know, awards don't always honor horror, you know. But when certain horror films or performances or both are excellent, sometimes things should be acknowledged. And I think if uh, things were different, and could go back and I could have done, I, maybe some others could do something to where Scream got nominated for like awards, like Academy Awards, such. I think uh, this film would have uh, had a, would have deserved like at least best original screenplay and best supporting actor for Matthew Lillard at the very minimum. You know, could argue maybe some more, but you know, I think those two would be definite contenders to at least look at. And whether or not Matthew Luller would have won, if acknowledged, you know, um, of course that's, uh, you know, that's like an alternate universe or a timeline that we could all think about. Um, you know, uh, Jerry Maguire, you know, um, Cuba Gooding Jr. won for that film, though people in hindsight say, you know, Edward Norton was better in Primal Fear, and I think of all the nominees, yeah. Though there's also Fargo. Um, William H. Macy was up for supporting actor, but I think he should have been up for best actor. Got demoted to supporting. Steve Buscemi probably, I think, should have gotten the supporting actor nomination. Um, but if we could also somehow remove somebody from the supporting actor category, um, yeah, of course, I would put Buscemi for Fargo and uh, up uh, Macy for Best Actor. So he's still nominated, but just in lead category. Um, put his name in there. And also Matthew Lillard. Um, I really like Matthew Lillard. You know, I think he gives an excellent performance and would have been worthy of like an Academy Award. Um, like I, I, That's how much I really love his performance and his character. And it's because of him, him playing that character is why... I think the character works so well. He's insane, but that also was a good balance to, you know, Billy is more 
a calm and collected where Stu is the best friend who's a bit more he's over the top he's a bit more crazy you know uh, and I just uh, I really love that about this film like uh, just how everything just came together perfectly and I know Wes Craven turned it down initially because he was, wasn't sure he wanted to do another horror film specifically slasher film he had done so many of those before and a fan came up to him and he hasn't done, really done anything that really was really really great and he needs to do something great again and so he looked at Scream again and then he did it and the rest is history and he directed the first four films of this franchise um yeah Scream is an excellent movie um because in a way it's more than just a slasher film you know there's again there's, there's quite a bit of comedy Matthew Lillard is quite humorous and also so is you know Jamie Kennedy I read in an uh, interview that uh, <clears throat> Ski Orange didn't really realize at the time of making the movie that the film was funny like he was taking it seriously like you should be and that he thought it was inappropriate that those two were sort of joking around or their performances were more comedic than perhaps he thought they should be. Um, but he realized later, when he saw the movie, that that was correct that for them to be that way. Also, they were more comedic than him. And him being as serious as he was fits the character in, in, with the tone of the film. There are some melodramatic moments of sorts here and there, but, you know, overall... It all fits within this world, you know. Very self-aware, meta-type film. I know some people aren't fan of films that are like meta, you know, and self-aware and such. But I guess it really depends on the movie, and I think it really works out well here. Um, uh, this is a franchise again that I saw all the way through before uh, the fourth film seeing them I believe it was a weekend in the summer just loving all of them from beginning to end all excellent um, in my mind uh, of course various degrees you know I do have a least favorite but even my least favorite I think is really good um, still uh, but you know that's me um, and that's my overall thoughts of uh, Scream for its 25th anniversary. Um, what do you think about Scream? Uh, do you enjoy it? Do you dislike it? Are you so... Or do you have some mixed feelings? Do you like certain aspects of it? Do you dislike certain aspects of it? Um, what, what do you think uh, about the film and as well as perhaps even the sequels? Of course, I'll talk about those in the coming weeks, but, you know... If you wanted to just sort of say, you know, which of the films are, are your favorite, <clears throat> maybe what of the sequels, uh, you might put over the first one, though. I think the first one is the best. Um, I enjoy it, all of them again, but the first one is definitely the best. It's the best of what it is, and it's just fantastic, I think. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's all right now from me to you. Hope you'll all have a great day, a great weekend, and a great week. See you all next time.